Okay, it's still the 22nd of March, and uh, this is part two of my, and the final part of my diatribe on abduction. Just to show you what I'm quoting from. This is a paper I wrote for the MA in Cultural Astronomy and Astrology um, in December 2003. It was my first paper, so my first ever academic paper. So it's a bit loose. So I've talked about, in section one, I talked about uh, abduction from the dawn of history, according to Hebraic Judaic tradition. Section two, I looked about abduction from the dawn of history, according to Greek myth. And section three, I looked at abduction in Northern European folklore. So I want to summarize this now before I draw conclusions. The three examples of abduction already given relate to three different time periods from three different cultures with three seemingly different points of origin, yet all have many similarities. The heavenly host that forcibly abducted the daughters of men against their will and impregnating them, with the resultant children being different, i.e. giants or men of renown. The heavenly host took their prisoners elsewhere, to a place outside of the scribe's knowledge, presumably back to heaven. The heavenly host is represented as a superior in force, technology and planning, with greater knowledge and power. They could be seen as representatives of a higher power, almost divine. The Greek gods forcibly abducted the sons and daughters of men against their will, and raped them, with the resultant children either being demi-mortals, i.e. Theseus, or mutations, i.e. Chiron. They took their prisoners elsewhere, to deserted beaches, to Mount Olympus, to remote islands, or even underground. The Greek gods are immortal, the epitome of power and divinity. They would have been seen by the scribes of the time as all-powerful. The stories of the abduction of babies and children by the inhabitants of the other world go back many centuries, if not millennia, and are endemic worldwide. In general, the fair folk do not abduct adults, but instead offer them the choice of passage, with men being sought for parenting purposes and women for their nursing and midwifery skills. The fair folk seem to us to be immortal, with lifespans nearly 400 times our own. From a cosmological perspective, it can be seen that all of the above examples have a link with the sky and the stars above. In the case of a heavenly host, whilst the ancient scriptures do not specifically refer to the sons of God or the children of heaven as having a celestial point of origin, it may be deduced from the overall context of the scriptures that this was so, at least in the eyes of the observers. No one knows precisely when the events described in the books of Enoch or Genesis actually took place, but this seems to have been before the time of the developing city cultures of Ur, Chaldea, Babylon or even Sumeria from whence came the first written records of man's observation of the heavens in ways that incorporated both astronomy and astrology, which are seen by some as being systems linking heaven and earth. This time is generally accepted as being of anywhere from two to 4,500 BC, with the first tablets pertaining to the study of the heavens in literature being dated at 2,200 BC, although the Sumerians were drawing uh, reference to the priests using the constellations of the stars around 4,600 BC. The Greek deities were seen by the inhabitants of the Eastern Mediterranean as having a point of celestial origin, even though there is no evidence of an indigenous tradition of stellar observation. The pantheon, headed by the sky god Zeus, were descended from the union of Kronos, Saturn, and his sister Rhea, who were in turn descended from Uranus, the sky god, and Gaia, the earth goddess. It may be seen as pertinent that of the six children of Kronos, Saturn, and Rhea, the three males, Hades, Pluto, Poseidon, Neptune, and Zeus, Jupiter, are acknowledged as planetary bodies by astronomers and astrologers, but the three females, Demeter, Ceres, Hestia, Vesta, and Hera, Juno, are asteroids of much smaller size. It could be argued that the earliest of Greek scribes, Homer, Hesiod, assimilated an integrated existent Egyptian and Babylonian cosmology into their own theology, writing of timings and events from long before their time, perhaps even before the events of the first section I commented on. 
Whilst the inhabitants of the other world have no specific cosmological models as we understand them, there is a strong tradition of working with the seasons, as indicated by the astronomical eightfold path. This is the course of the sun on its year-long journey through the heavens, via winter solstice, in bulk, spring equinox, Beltane, summer solstice, Lammas, autumn equinox and Sawain through once again to winter solstice. The Neolithic origins of the other world stories show a greater resonance with moon culture as opposed to the sun culture of later millennia. It may be that the pre-Celtic inhabitants of Northwest Europe were attempting to bring heaven down to earth when they erected the massive earthworks, cairns and stone circles that stand to this day. Alexander Tom, in his 1967 book, The Stone Circles of Britain, claims that there exists incontrovertible proof of exact astronomical alignments pertaining to stone circles and standing stones, suggesting the probability that the ancient lunar-dominated peoples of Northwest Europe lived more symbiotically with the Earth and its place in the heavens, and that they responded and reacted more empathically to nature in all of its forms, and this resulted in their establishing a strong link with the other world. All three of the above mentioned examples have a strong link with landscape architecture of the times. The legends of the heavenly host first came from a time when the notion of agriculture and settled community was only beginning to take root in human society, around six to 7,000 BCE. From these days we have the tales of the first communities in Mesopotamia and the first stellar observations and aligned temples in early uh, Middle Eastern culture. By the time of the Greek gods, humanity had formed cities and nation states. The pyramids had been built directly aligning to the four cardinal points and civilization had spread through the Eastern Mediterranean. Mediterranean. In Northwest Europe, the last ice age started retreating about 7,000 years BCE, leading to the land bridge linking Britain to mainland Europe to disappear. As the ice retreated, the indigenous Neolithic hunter-gatherer tribes people took the opportunity to become farmers and form stable communities. And from these days, there still, still exist Neolithic mounds, tumuli, henges, barrows, and astronomically aligned stone circles. There is also the question of the benefits that have arisen from these encounters with the abductors. The heavenly host taught the sons and daughters of men the arts of astrology, charms, enchantments, herbalism and healing. Prometheus stole a fire of the gods and gave it to humanity. What was the fire of the gods? Was it knowledge of astrology or was it knowledge in general? Was it self-reflective consciousness, the ability to think and be detached from emotional content? Was it fire itself? The link between Prometheus and Pandora suggests that although the gift of fire led to technological advancement for humanity, it also led to vice, immorality, and all the other afflictions from Pandora's box. In the tales of the fair folk, those who are abducted and serve willingly, want midwives, minstrels, etc., these are often returned with the gift of second sight, or healing, or song. It could be seen as if the abductors have a sense of guilt for their actions and seek to atone by passing on knowledge, skills or information. Where do the original myths and legends emanate from? Is it feasible that there exists a dimension parallel to ours that has different time and space and different logic? Alkis Kontos suggests that the world enchanted was a place of mystery and wonderment, in which nature, spiritually imbued, was the spiritual dimension of the world, its enchanted magical quality that rendered it infinite, not amenable to calculability, spirit could not be quantified, it permitted and invited mythologicalization. This could be seen as inferring, inferring that myth and legend are unqualifiable in terms of logical, rational and analytical and mental and verbal communication. To quote, to quote J.R. Tolkien, Muller's view of mythology as being a disease of language can be abandoned without regret. Mythology is not a disease at all, although like all human things it may become diseased. It would be more near the truth to say that languages, especially modern European languages, are actually a disease of mythology. 
To conclude, throughout recorded history, abduction exists as a recorded phenomenon that is noted but not commented on. It may be that the three case studies mentioned above are representative of their times as much as the abduction cases involving the bogus social workers and the UFOs are representative of today's times, in that there always seems to be some indiscernible and terrifying threat that might one day snatch individuals or their loved ones away at a moment's notice. The heavenly host, the Greek pantheon and the inhabitants of the other world all have had a strong working relationship with the cosmos, whether the cosmos in question was heavenly and stellar or planetary and lunar. This could be seen as implying that from the start of recorded history, humanity has related to the heavens with an element of awe and trepidation, based at least partly um, around a fear that the gods would come and abduct one or one's relations into thin air, rarely, if ever, to return. And yet the possible rewards of these interactions with the gods have always tempted us. Whether it be the lessons of a heavenly host, the fire of the Greek gods, or the gift of song from the fair folk. It seems that there is an element of atonement and compensation for those abductees that either go willingly or fulfil what is required of them, and that this reward sets oneself apart from the rest of one's peers. As far as known, humanity in Northwest Europe stabilised into farmer settler modes as opposed to hunter gatherer modes at the end of the last ice age, approximately 10,000 years, uh, 10,000 BC. From this time until the end of the Neolithic era, around 3000 BC, influences pertaining to heavens were seen as primarily omnipotent. From 2500 BC onwards, as, human as humanity formed into more communities, more earthly based influences began to dominate as people began to acquire material values and possessions. It could be argued that within the last 200 years, the Western world has become so orientated towards materialism and opulence that it has lost touch with its gods, replacing them with televisions, cars and money. It also seems that since the advent of recorded history, there has been a relationship with structure at the geophysical level that defies rational understanding. The pyramids of Giza and Stonehenge are just a few examples of stellar geometry with a purpose of defining the position of the Earth in relation to the cosmos. This relates that the origina originators of these structures knew more about geometry, astronomy and mathematics than we ever thought possible. This adds weight to the theories concerning the existence of intelligent civilizations on this planet in the distant past, and in many ways is reminiscent of original myth. Witness, for example, the case of the USA. As demonstrated above in the case of Rip Van Winkle, immigrants tried to eradicate indigenous belief systems and superimpose their own upon the land they had relocated to. Through not connecting with the local indigenous land energies, the immigrants lost their sense of connection with the Earth. The majority of UFO sightings and abductions by UFO take place in the US of A. Some people have concluded that instead of seeing the indigenous land-based energies, the abductees are experiencing the realm of the airy fairy, the air elementals or spirits of the other world, other world as the pixie or elf represents the earth elementals or spirits of the other world. One such explanation of this phenomenon within the New Age stroke holistic spectrum is that humanity inhabits a dimension of existence parallel to and occasionally interactive with other dimensions in many ways similar to our own, but with specific differences, notably time flow. This theory could allow for separate or other worlds connected in the same space but resonating at a different vibration, possibly being home to what we understand as the fair folk, or UFO beings, or even gods, or dare I say it, crop circle maker. It may be that our view of human abduction over the years has been to look out far away into the heavens for those who have gone, and for answers as to the nature of the phenomenon of abduction. Our ancient monuments and landscape architecture reflect our species' desire to evolve onto the heavens and into the cosmos. It may be that as a race, 
We are re-evaluating our position between heaven and earth as a result of recent advances in areas such as space travel, computers, quantum physics, and especially the acceptance of a holistic paradigm. Perhaps we should be looking parallel to and next door to where we really are for an understanding to the abduction phenomenon and reassessing humanity's relationship with the planet we live on, the inhabitants of that planet and the heavens above. There you go, folks. I hope you enjoyed that. I'm quite happy to send the bibliography and copies of this to anyone who asks. I'll probably ask for a minor contribution. But anyway, hope you enjoyed that. Take care. Bye.